Good morning, everyone. So uh, we are now in the third week of our Clouds of Witnesses uh, series. And this is a very important series to the church. Um, we got, first of all, we got the name of the series from the Pauline Epistle to the Hebrews, in which in it St. Paul says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so, easy, so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our life, of our faith, excuse me, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So these, this is the, these are the verses that are the, 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 the inspiration, if you will, for this, for this series. And uh, in the previous weeks, Father Paul, he covered uh, St. Mina of Vayat, the great martyr, uh, who rejected the wealth and riches of the world, the power position, right? He talked about how he had, at a very young age, he had the allure of all of that. He rejected all of that in order to endure severe torture at the hand of the emperor and before losing his head and gaining the crown of martyrdom, right? So he became a great martyr for us. And then two weeks ago, I'm sure many of you still remember, as, as I do, the amazing story of the glorious and victorious overcomer of lust, over the fighter against the flesh, the beautiful Saint Mary of Egypt, right, who was a prostitute and a harlot, weighed down by lust, suffered in the desert with the agony of lust for 17 years, on top of the 17 years of living as a harlot, right, as a prostitute. But through prayer and repentance and through a set in the wilderness, she became a light to the world, and she became so light and so free that she said that she glided through the air, okay? And so they were two amazing saints, two of this numerous, numerous cloud of witnesses. But I think if you're like me, sometimes you hear the stories of the martyrs and the saints and they feel so far away. They feel so distant. They feel obviously hundreds or even thousands of years away, okay? So today we're actually going to talk about a modern day saint, okay, of the church and because to show us that the same God who was working is working and will continue to work in his church till the end of time. But before I introduce to you the saint that we're going to talk about today, I do want to talk about a conversation that I had last week with a young man who's in the church, um, and he just had an honest question, regularly attend, and, but he was conflicted about the veneration of saints. He was conflicted about how it is that he feels we worship saints. And so I said to him, first off, I agree with you. Sometimes we have a misunderstanding of our relationship with the saints. So for clarification purposes, we don't worship saints. We worship God alone. We worship God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Even Saint Mary, the mother of God herself, we do not worship her. But we esteem her or we venerate her. Why? Because God has chosen her in order to be the mother bearer of Christ, right? In order to be... Uh, the mother of God, the Theotokos. This is the honor given to the mother of God by God himself. So we honor her for letting God work in her, through her, with her. This is the reality of all the saints. As great as they are, men, women, or, or children, right? There's no other. Men, women, or children, okay? Um, as great as they are, they are only great, they are only venerated because of the God that they allowed to work through them. Because we believe in orthodoxy, it is a synergy, right? God didn't enforce himself upon any of these men or women, but rather they accepted, willingly accepted that God would work in them, with them, and through them. And so in the Greek word, for example, the, the, the term for God is agios, right? As we say, agios o theos, agios ishiros. Agios is holy. That's only God. Only God. But when we say of the, of the martyrs or the saints, we say axios or axia, right? Axios or axia means worthy, okay? What are they worthy of? They are worthy of the honor given to them by God. Who gives them this worthiness? God and the church, right? Because the church sees the work of God in them and the church declares this person worthy of that. So from, like, from the honor, it's very, very important, this young man was right, that sometimes we worship 
we worship the saints wrongly, but rather we should venerate them and give them the honor that is due to them that has been established for them by God himself. Okay, so this is a very, very important understanding. Second, he asked me something that I think really needs each of us to kind of meditate on and to think about, but I will try to give what I deem to be a what I deem to be maybe a sufficient answer to the question, but one that each of us ultimately has to come to with the understanding of the church. He asked this question. He said, do I need to pray to saints to be saved? Can't I just pray to God alone? And honestly, this is a valid question, right? This is, this is a valid question. But let's, rather than answer the question sort of directly, let me present to you the orthodox understanding of the church and salvation, and maybe we can get to the answer that way. In the Orthodox Church, we believe that salvation cannot occur outside of the Orthodox Church, okay, outside of the Church, excuse me, outside of the Mother Church, the Ark of Noah. Those who are in the Ark are saved. Those who are outside of the Ark cannot be saved. The Church did not spend a lot of time worrying about the salvation of those outside of the Ark. Basically, the Church has said, we know what works, we know the Church works, come into the Church and you can be saved, okay? So we don't get into what happens to this person or the remote person in the island who never, like, we know all those questions that are in the back of our mind, right? But that's not the church. The church says we have a means and a way that works, which is the life of the church. The church saves. And another thing about the church saving is one cannot be saved alone, okay? This has to be the reality. I cannot be saved alone. I cannot be saved on my own and forget the rest of you. Though sometimes I think that's what we want to do, right? I'll just worry about me. 2017, I'm going to do me, right? No, that's not, that is not salvation in the Orthodox Church, okay? Salvation in the Orthodox Church is all of us together working towards salvation. The church is not a building in a locale with a group of people in a certain place, okay? The church is not just St. Mark of Fairfax, Virginia in 2017. The church is from the beginning and will continue to the end. The church is living. The church is not a moment in time. When we stand to pray the liturgies, we're not standing just with the people around us. We are standing with the people before us and even the people to come after us because the church in her glory, in her liturgical service, becomes outside of time. She is, she is theanthropic. She is God and she is man, right? So in her theanthropacy, in her God-manhood, she is capable of being outside of time as God was. So her existence is not limited to this place. If we agree to all of those, I asked him a simple question. If there was a job that you wanted and somebody you heard of had the job, would it not be wise to go and ask them, hey, what do I have to do to get this job? Right? I, I think that's sound advice that I would give to my son or to anybody saying, hey, you want to be an engineer? Well, I know engineer so-and-so. Why don't you talk to him about what it takes to be an engineer? Or go to engineering school, right? So you go to methods or ways to learn. Secondly, I asked him, Your good friend, he had a good friend who passed away, a, couple, a, fr a mutual friend of ours who passed away. I said, do you still talk to this person? Do you believe he hears you? And he said, yeah, absolutely, I believe he hears you. I believe, do you believe that he cares about the things that you care about? Do you think he's, yeah, he's like, yeah, he's watching over me. I was like, okay. So if somebody you love is watching over you and cares about the things that you care about and has the means of attaining what you've attained, why would you not want to use the saints as a means to salvation? It's not will it or won't it, but why would you not? They're an amazing resource, if you will, forgive the word, of the church in that they are fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters and children of ours who are deemed saints that we can go. When we ask St. Mary to pray for us, we are saying, St. Mary, in your place of honor, Put on your heart what's on my heart. I don't know who wouldn't want to do that, right? So whether that's going to save me or not going to save me, I would rather use it than not use it, okay? So that's how we approach the, 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 the reality of the intercession with the saints. And there's a beautiful story about St. John Chrysostom, and it holds true with any saint and any virtue that you want, okay? If you want to build up a virtue 
They say that the, the glory of this is such that you can ask, for example, St. Anthony, if you wanted the humility of St. Anthony, ask St. Anthony to, get, to, to, to help show you the way in which he let God work in him to build up this virtue. The story of St. John Chrysostom goes that when he went to read the epistle of Romans, he couldn't understand the epistle fully. He was struggling with it. So he prayed and he prayed, and St. Paul came to him, and he interpreted for him the epistle of Romans. And from that, we got the commentary of Romans by St. John Chrysostom. Okay? So the next time you read St. John Chrysostom and you don't understand him, dare we ask him to come and visit us and explain, like, why do we say that that's so impossible? It's only impossible if we probably don't believe in the same way that they believe. But the cloud of witnesses of the saints is something that is a treasure of the life of the church and one that I don't think we tap into enough, okay? So that's just a little bit about that that I felt we probably should, um, and I probably should address just so that we have a proper understanding of this potential life that we have with the saints. So today, as I said, the saint that we're going to talk about is a, a current day saint, a modern day saint, if you will. Um, and many of you have heard of him. Some in this church have probably even had the benefit or, of being served by him or, or serving with him, right? And his name is Father Bishoy Kamil, okay? And that name is very, very, very common to many and is probably known by many, especially in the Coptic Orthodox Church. The great Father Bishoy lived only about 48 years, I believe. He's, I think he was born 31 and he passed away in 79, okay? So he's quite a young man. But in his time, I can tell you that his life is indicative of what we want our saints and what we believe our saints to be. Okay, so he hasn't officially been canonized by the church as a saint, but I believe that that day will come. But also I believe that his life and his works will speak to, to that moment, right? And the canonization, though I, I think, it, it, God willing, and I think and many believe in the church that his canonization will come, but that doesn't stop us from seeking or learning from how God worked in this man, in this era, in this day of the church, okay? So I think it's really, really, uh, hopefully, um, a great opportunity to learn about somebody who didn't live too long ago. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, when asked to, uh, to give this, the, to, to speak on this saint, I was given sort of the opportunity to speak on anyone that, that I wanted. And I, um, I don't know, just, and then Abuna said modern day saint, and Father Bishoy Kamel was the first one. And I honestly, before this week, I didn't know too much about him be beyond maybe the stories that we heard and the so on. So, I prayed and I prayed that, you know, that not only do I learn and give you the story of a great man, but that we can connect with him and, and see him. See him as a true father, because he really was. So, forgive me, I'm probably going to do a lot of reading. Um, there's a lot of quotes I generally don't like to read. It's not my style. I like to have my hands free, right? But uh, So if I do a lot of reading, it's not because, like, I didn't, but it's rather because I just wanted to make sure that I delivered to you kind of accurately the sentiment or, or the context of what was, what was being conveyed or what I'm, what I'm wishing to tell you, okay? So, but if we were going to create, like, sort of, let's bring it back to 2017, every, everything marketing-wise is word clouds, right? Word clouds. You see these these awesome word clouds on Facebook. You're funny, you're eccentric, you're whatever, okay? If we were going to create a word cloud for, um, for Abu Nabshoi, I think these words would definitely be in it. And no particular order and no particular size, but we'll talk on some of the important words that we can gain or that we can learn from Father Bishoy. Humble, servant, love, cross, education, struggle, virginity, partnership, mission, teaching, Calling, service, church, priest, gifted, prayer, cancer, learning. It's a lot of words there. Lots and lots of words. And I honestly stopped short. Okay? But I'll say the one thing that I kept seeing about Father, and this is, this is the, the, the picture of Father Bishoy Cameron. Just really, really beautiful, beautiful man, honestly. The more I kept reading about him, the more this verse came to me that I, that, the, when the Lord Christ says that to everyone who has will be given, right? In, 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 the, in the story of the, the man with the ten minas and the five minas and the one mina, the man with the one mina, he didn't honor the one mina that he had, so they said, go and give it to the man who has ten. But they said, no, Lord, he has ten minas. And they said, he who has will be given, okay? And because not only is he given, but he's doing something with it. Abu Nabshoi 
he really, he really worked with the talents, allowed God to work through the talents and the gifts that he was given. And it's awesome. This is so rare, but it's awesome when people really say, you know what, every talent and every gift that I'm given, I'm going to pour, like, I'm going to use them to the fullest that I can, right? And sometimes we, and so, like, my goal is also, my hope is that we learn from his life more so than, again, learning a great story. But if there's anything that I would say to all of us is we're given great talents, many of us, and we have an opportunity to use them or to not use them, okay? And so I would hope that from Abuna's story, we will find that the using of those talents is just a great way to experience God in our lives, okay? Just a little bit about his past. He was born December 6, 1931. His name was Sammy Kamer. He was born in a town called Damanhur, which I believe is on the Nile Delta, somewhere actually between Alexandria and, and Cairo. Uh, he was an excellent student by all measures. Everyone who, everyone who speaks to his academ academic abilities said that he was a very intelligent man, was well-versed in arts and science, had degrees in, he became a science teacher, and then had gained degrees in psychology, education, theology, and philosophy. Okay? So um, think about those things and think about how they play into the life. This is not a man who at any means thought he was, you know, at, this is just what he went into psychology, education, theology, philosophy. Right? I think in some ways, someone well equipping themselves for something they don't even know is coming, but just being equipped. He loved, he loved learning, loved teaching, and that ultimately led him to the service of services, right? The Sunday school service, if you will, which um, sometimes I do think we downplay, right? I understand Sunday school is a new... Sunday school is a, a new to the life of the church. Sunday school is only about um, 100 years old or so, maybe, you know, from the early turn of the 19th... Of the, 20th century. So it, it's new to our church, but in the hands of someone well-educated and, and, and faithful, it's a great way to build up our children, right, in the true faith and knowledge of Lord and God and of the church, right? He loved the Coptic language. He loved the Coptic hymns. In 57, he became an associate professor at the Higher Institute of Education at Alexandria University. So by all accounts, in church and beyond it, he, had extra he was extraordinarily gifted, talented, and learned young man. Everything for him was really good. Okay, everything for him was really good at this time. So we will come to a point in time, sort of the first point in time, and the first word that I want us to focus on is, is calling, okay? So from the word, from the word cloud that we, that we tried to associate. So we come now to November, November 18, 1959. Play, pay attention to the timeline because it does matter in this story, okay? So we're November 18th, okay? Sammy is taking his Sunday school children to go meet the newly enthroned patriarch at this time, who was? Pope, Pope Cyril, Pope Carlos VI, right? This meeting would be the meeting that would change his life. As the story goes, just before the arrival of, of Sammy Kamel's youth group, the patriarch was involved in a discussion with Abu Amina Skander about the pro, proposed Marigirgis church and sporting. So there's background. Uh, when the Sunday school class, okay, Krullus said that they would not begin, Pope Krullus said that they would not begin to build a church in sporting until they had ordained a priest for it. When the Sunday school class entered the room, Father Skander pointed at Sammy and in apparent spontaneity <laughs> exclaimed, here is the man who can be a spiritual father to the people in sporting. After a brief exchange between Sammy and his holiness, the patriarch marked a cross on the young man's head and said, God has given us the sign that you are to be a priest. Okay. I shall ordain you next Sunday. Sammy explained, not married, but the Pope replied, if God inspired him to make this decision, God will also inspire Sammy to find a bride. Okay? No pressure, fellas. No pressure. Okay? The story gets even cooler from here. Okay? But here's something that we don't know about this story that wasn't said. At this time, he actually had no intentions of staying in the world. His goal was to actually go into the monastery to become a monk, and he was ready for, he was preparing for the mon monasticism in 58. But his father got sick, and it delayed his, and it, because he felt responsible for his father, he delayed going to the monastery, okay? So oftentimes we lay for ourselves plans. We lay for ourselves plans and good plans, and no one's saying that the plans are bad, but God may have 
a different plan, okay? Monasticism, very good, and I believe based on the man that I, I got to know, he would have been an excellent monk. But God said, I need you in a very, very different way. Okay, so what did he do? He goes to a spiritual mentor, and he goes to the monastery from that Monday to come back on November 20th. What day did he meet the, His Holiness? November 18th, right? So we met him November 18th. So now he's back from the monastery, November 23rd, speaking to a spiritual mentor. And the spiritual mentor says to him, hey, so what'd you get out of your... So he goes to the monastery to pray about this matter because he was, he wanted to be a monk, but also now he's got this. So he went to pray and he went to pray for clarity. So he comes back and the spiritual mentor asks him, he says, so, you know, where are you with this? Are you going to be a monk or are you going to be a priest? And he says, I don't have clarity. And so the spiritual mentor said to him one word. He said, if you don't have clarity, then we obey the word of his holiness. Let's go, let's go find your wife, okay? You're going to be a priest. This speaks to the life of obedience and the life of calling, okay? I'll, I'll talk more about calling, but just to show you how God puts things together. We're now on November 23rd. So, he's looking for a wife. Where do you go? Your best friend's house. Okay, you go to your best friend's house, you ask for their, sis their sister's hand in marriage, and you get married on November 24th, the next day. Okay? November 24th, 1959. One day later. By all standards of everyone in this room, you're crazy! You have no idea what you're getting into! I honestly think if we asked them, they would say, you have no idea what we were getting into. Guys, we've been doing it all wrong, honestly. There's months and years of dating, whatever. One day, find a calling, go get a wife. No, I'm just kidding, all right? But obviously, for a special, a special man with a special calling comes sort of a special, a special way or a special route. But I do want to talk about calling, okay? Because as I said before, we are all called. Everyone here is called to something. We may not be called by the hands of one of the greatest popes of our generation. We may not be called in such a unique way, but we're all called, and we're all called to do something, okay? And when we're called to do it, we're called to answer it, okay? I fear often when the calling comes, we have seven excuses for why it doesn't work, why I can't answer that calling. And then upon the seven excuses, when those are rebutted, what do I do? I get a doctor's note, I get a letter from my parents, I get whatever because I'm not answering this calling, okay? But what I'm saying to you is from the life of Father Beshoy, I encourage you all to heed your calling. Your calling may be the person next to you. Your calling may be to serve God in some crazy way, in a way that doesn't make sense. How did Abuna Beshoy come to understand his calling? Right? Did he do it on his own? No. He went to a spiritual mentor. He heard the voice of the Pope and prayer. Right? Those three things, or those two things, right? A spiritual guide and prayer and your own. Those three things are the way that you make decisions about the calling. Don't find your own calling and don't just listen to a man and don't just pray in your own room and not sort of bring your thoughts to light. Okay? The three have to come together in order for us to find our calling. And I'm encouraging every one of you Let's be like Abun Abshoy in this regard. Let's say, God, I'm open to my calling. I don't know what it is. I may just be with my Sunday school class today. Tomorrow I'm asked to go live in Africa or anywhere else, okay? Or whatever the calling is. Again, big or small, the calling is the calling, and we want to be open and ready to receive it. The second word that I want to speak to about, honestly, is partnership. And this is really important. And dare I say there would be no Abun Abshoy Kamel if there were no Tosoni Anjir, Okay? She was his partner. She saw that he was called to do something very important, and she helped him to do it. They shared in the joys, in the service, in the struggle, and I believe in the glory that's to come as well. She's an amazing woman by all accounts. I haven't had the pleasure to meet her, but those who have met her say nothing but the most glowing things about about her and the way she shares stories of her and Abuna with love and affection for God and the people that they served and, and just there was a mutual respect for the man that she married as well and for his service and, and for their partnership. They were together, okay? And what, what set allows a woman 
to say yes in a day. Granted, she probably got to know him as friends. But what would, other than she saw something so important and saw and felt sure that this man was called, that I can't be in the way of that calling, but rather I need to push him to that calling. And so that's what I'm saying. Great servants, guys, are not made by the servants alone. Okay? Husbands, if you see something amazing in your wife, foster it. Push her towards it. Make her the great person that she is called to be. Wives, same for your husbands. Parents, do so for your children. What we often do is we fear the calling. Nobody told the Sony, your life is going to be great when Abuna becomes. In fact, their life going forward, insane. Okay? But if you speak to her, she was 100%. This was his calling, and my job was to support. She says, in her own words, she says that my day of consecration came on the day of our wedding, that I was consecrated to a calling as well. And so she said, I found my calling on that day by being, by being his spouse and his bride and his tasoni, okay? So everyone, everyone has that calling, that amazing calling. Please, please, please build each other up so that we can answer the calling, push each other towards the calling, and go into the calling together, okay? We oftentimes, as a church, our best servants are not serving our church fully, because there is restriction, and, and, and I, I understand it. I'm human. I'm with the rest of you. But when you see somebody so gifted in anything, foster that gift. That, that's a personal plea for me because nothing is harder on someone than when you have a gift and you feel you can't fulfill it. You feel you can't. So uh, that's just a personal plea. Foster your kids' gifts. Foster your wives' gifts. Foster your husband's gifts as I think Tassoni and Abuna did for each other. It was absolutely beautiful. So he's now a new priest in a new church that's not established, right? So now he's got to worry about building the church in Alexandria. And he does, he works in partnerships, okay? It was said about Abuna that he found these great, sort of these great engineers and architects who built the churches, not just for sporting, but many churches throughout Egypt and throughout Alexandria, okay? And he always worked in partnership. They had told Abuna at the time that when he was flourishing, it was about three years into his ministry, you need a second priest. And he had made friendships and whatever, and other priests were like, no, 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 don't do that. The best priesthood is the priesthood that's by yourself. Don't bring other priests in. He's like, you crazy? He's like, I need to share. So not only did he get one priest, but he got five priests, okay? And he ordained five priests. And he worked in partnership in the service, and he always worked in humility and love with those who he worked with. A really, really an amazing... Um, amazing man with an amazing reputation of love and serve. One of the priests that he served with over that time was Abu Tadros uh, Malati, who we'll hear some quotes from, and we'll hear from Tassoni Anjir. There are many, many amazing, many of his disciples have gone on to be bishops and priests in the church, uh, really men, and, and also servants, uh, consecrated female servants in the church. Amazing men and women, like, th coming through the fruit of an amazing man. Again, the fruit of the Holy Spirit that's working through him. His reputation climbed, climbed, and so he was chosen to represent the Coptic Church in the World Council of Churches. This is in 60 and 65, okay? So these are, this is very early on he's going. Then he was sent to a small city in a faraway country nobody knew anything about called Los Angeles, okay? At least from Alexandria's perspective, right? Um, he delegated him to go pray the first liturgy to celebrate the first liturgy in Los Angeles. And then from L.A., these are some of the stops that he made, okay? He went to San Francisco, Denver, Portland, Houston, Seattle, Jersey City, Austria, England, France, right? I mean, the man went and served above and beyond in many, many places. I remember the church that I used to pray to, and, uh, pray to, pray at in Jersey City, St. George and St. Schnuda. There was a pic, they have a sort of a, a line of the priests that have served there, and the first was Abu Nab Shoy Kem. And that really hit me, like, you know, I mean, we grew up in a time where we were used to priests being there, but he went and he was establishing and growing church. Also, in addition to the churches as he was growing inside and around Alexandria, I mean, he established many daughter churches. So he had two words. The next words from the bubble cloud or the, the cloud, uh, the word cloud is uh, faithful servant. This man was a faithful, faithful servant, right? He loved the church so much. When he was directed to go somewhere, he went. He trusted God. He wasn't so much concerned about sort of the, the obstacles of man, if you will, right? He had faith in God. And I don't know, I'm sure if you grew up in Los Angeles, you probably have heard this story. But there's a beautiful story about when he first got to Los Angeles, they wanted 
to buy a church there, and the church cost $100,000, okay? And so when he got there, he pulled the, the legna together, and he's like, we're going to buy this church. It required a down payment of $25,000. we are talking early 70s, or so again, um, recognize that money, money sort of has a different, but the church only had a few hundred dollars. And so they started to accuse Abuna of like wanting to weigh down the church and whatever, and basically like, how are we supposed to pay this? We only have a few hundred. How can we? He said, listen, we have two weeks to come up with a down payment. And if you don't come up with it, I'm going to come up with it from my own pocket. Abuna was broke, okay? So his own pocket was clearly not a way of saying, I'm going to contribute anything. So what he did, he prayed and he gathered the, the youth in the area and he ultimately ended up raising something like $23,000, okay? $23,000. Cash and checks was enough for the down payment for the church. He gets in a cab. I forget where he was going. I think he was on his way to the bank or something of that effect. But he gets in a cab, and ultimately he loses the wallet in the cab. Okay? And this is all the money that was raised. This is now, and now he's got to go meet with the legna. And we know bored people are very difficult, right? So he goes to meet with the, with the legna. And basically, and, there, and he's worried. So that night, he gathers the youth, and he's like, we're going to pray, we're going to pray, we're going to pray. Early hours of the morning, midnight, one, two, and, they, and they're, they're praying, and a man knocks on their door, okay? And it's a Muslim man. And it's a Muslim man who happened to be the cab driver, okay? And the cab driver just happened to have the wallet in his hands. And so he said, are you a priest? He said, yeah, I'm a priest. How'd you find me? He's like, it's Los Angeles. It's, nice. it's not really hard to find a guy like you, all right? Like, okay, like, he's like, you're a funny-looking guy. I asked around, and, you know, I found out where you lived, and I came. And so he said, thank you. So Tasuni's like, in Arabic, so she like, Shufla wa yakhud the reward, because like in Arabic, so, and he's like, so he understood her because he was a Pakistani Arab man. He's like, no, no, I don't want a reward. I want to contribute to the building of the church. And he made a donation. He made a donation to the church. The power of prayer of this man was unbelievable. He did not see obstacles as being things that would stop God from doing what he needed to do at his church. I wish that we could all be so faithful that we can ap approach the obstacles in our own life with the reality of who's fully in control. Whether we're expanding a church or building our own homes or whatever it is that we're doing, there is one who's fully in charge and one who is, as we were talking, as, as John was saying in the, in, the in the children's sermon today, right? Like, Bring your five loaves and two fish because they're meaningless to God, but he just wants to see that you offer him back what he gave you. And he will do, they're not, they're not what he depends on, but rather he wants to see your willingness to let him work. This was Abu Nabshoi. This is how he approached his life of service in all these churches. And there's many, many, many amazing stories like this. Okay? But it wasn't just that, so what did he do once he got to these churches? First of all, like he established in them a life of prayer. And prayer is an amazing part, as we just saw from this small story, amazing part of Abuna Bshoi's life. Um, there were three distinct areas of prayer that Abuna always focused on. Personal prayer, okay? For sure, personal prayer, liturgical prayer, and then ultimately there was what, what we call sort of the, the prayer of the mind and the heart, which was meditation and theological study. Again, this is a man who learned a lot. So he used his study and his theological as a means for, as a means for prayer. He would never waste time, if you will, when it came to prayer. So if he was in a car, he was reciting the Jesus prayer, right? If he was going somewhere, he would just say the Jesus, always invoking the name of Jesus with him wherever he went, okay? He loved a book called the Philokalia. The Philokalia is actually an Eastern Orthodox book that speaks a lot about prayer and sort of the spiritual life. And these are some of the things that came out of the Philokalia that Abu Nabshoi that you could say Abu Nabshoi would, would say adhere to or would say that were important in his life. And these, I think, are things that we should learn. One, he said that in the Philokalia, and again, it says, if you're a theologian, you will, truly, you will pray truly. And if you pray truly, you are a theologian. Prayer is the energy which accords with dignity of the intellect. It is the intellect's true and highest activity. Prayer is the remedy of gloom and despondency. Prayer is the fruit of joy and thankfulness. Prayer is the flower of gentleness and of freedom from anger. If you patiently accept what comes, 
you will always pray with joy. If you endure something painful out of love for wisdom, you will find the fruit of this during prayer. Bread is the food for the body, and holiness is food for the soul. Spiritual prayer is food for the intellect. I would say that his perspective on prayer is a little different than mine. Mine goes something like this. Prayer is something that I do for five minutes to check a box, because if I don't pray, I'll feel guilty. I want his life of prayer. I want this loving prayer. I want this f- prayer of freedom. I want this prayer of grace. That's the prayer that I want to that I that I want to experience. I, I just he prayed, and again he prayed every day. And I think if we can learn something from him, is be men and women of prayer, real prayer, the prayer that is in in, in this light, in the light of these these sentences that I shared with you. So in 1965, when he was at the World Council of Churches, he got permission to go visit the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. So I'm going to read to you his words on this visit, and then I'm going to read to you an eyewitness of this visit. So from his words, it says, The deepest influences on me were an altar, which stands at the traditional base of the cross, and then an icon of the crucifixion. In the icon, Mary Magdalene is bent over our Lord's feet, kissing them. As for the Virgin Mother of God, she was standing erect in silence. I felt as I gazed on all this how much Christ had endured for me. I found the church empty, so I stayed for a long time. I prayed earnestly that I might overcome my failings and indifference and my inability to crucify myself and die with Christ. Then I asked the one who had been buried here to remember his servants in Alexandria. I begged Christ's pardon, who was crucified and scourged for me. I discovered a river flowing from the life of Jesus into my life. You cannot speak about Abu Nabshoi without speaking about the cross. Okay, Tassoni says that in his room he had the icon of the cross above his bed, and that's where he spent hours, hours at the feet of, uh, at the, feet of the cross. And they said that his eyewitness account is when he was dying, was doctored and looking to make, sort of make conversation was like, why do you love this picture so much? And he said, truly, Martha had chosen the greatest place, right? The place at the feet of Jesus. So that was just his account. Now let's see what an eyewitness account that was revealed after he passed, okay? So this wasn't revealed during his life, but was revealed after after he passed. It says, a man who eventually became a monk of the monastery of St. Anthony the Great at the Red Sea was present in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem and watched while Beshoi venerated the holy icon. The eyewitness became conscious of light emanating from the priest's body. For as long as Bishoy stood at the site of crucifixion, light radiated from him. Sorry, I, <laughs> I don't even know if I, I should read more. Like, light radiated from him. This man had an amazing, amazing relationship. So the, actually then it's just a, a lot of sort of prose from the author himself, so I, I won't read those things. But this is a miracle affirming a saint, okay? This is what this is. This is a miracle affirming a saint. As I said again, he wasn't necessarily, he hasn't been canonized as of yet, but for sure, for sure, his life of prayer was so deep and so amazing that he was viewed like... Whether he knew he was emanating or not, I don't know. But the eyewitness account says that for sure, light was emanating from him as he stood in front of the icon of the crucifixion. I would imagine that it wasn't a one-time thing either. He believed in the power of the cross. He pushed his confessors to contemplate on the scars of the crucified to draw from his power of love. These are... So he wrote two books on the cross, At the Foot of the Cross and With Christ I Am Crucified. He put above his bed a picture of the crucified Jesus Christ with Mary Magdalene kneeling at his feet. During his last days when he had a high fever and was not in his full awareness, as if speaking through his subconscious, he was talking about how much he loved that picture and asked his wife to buy herself a similar one. When the disease had progressed, Dr. Halim, who was responsible for our beloved priest's medical care, was joking with him to ease his pain, asking, What do you like about the picture, Father? Father was silent for a while, then in a calm, deep manner said, What can I say? Indeed, Mary chose the best place ever found. Here are some other famous quotes of his about the cross. 
The more we contemplate on the cross, the more our unity and knowledge become deeper with our Lord Jesus Christ. The Christian cannot say that he knows Christ unless he has a sacred unity with and continuous contemplation on Christ's cross. So let us start a 10-minute daily retreat to contaminate on, on him who was crucified for us. I'm, think, I'm thinking that's contemplate. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, carrying the cross is a daily invitation. The cross, O oh Lord, was inside your heart since the very beginning, before you carried it on your back. The cross represents your love and sacrifice. The best scene that satisfies my eyes is to see you carrying the cross, for it is the sanctification of my cross. The cross is the sign of the Son of Man, the sign of the children of God. His secret, the, Abuna Tedros will tell you that the secret of Abuna Abshoi's ministry was his preoccupation with the cross and his desire for everyone to share and enjoy with him the blessings of the cross. And they say that out of his love, that God, actually I'll save this for later because it's, it's a bit difficult. So, another, so the cross is something that all of us, again, cross is one of those words that I want us all to connect with. So now I'm going to give you some quotes about Abuna and his ministry, sort of his love for others his love for people, and then his love for, um, his, love for his flock, his love for non-Christians, and then ultimately his love for a special group of people of which he was also amongst. So this is Tassoni now speaking. She said, his life as a priest had always to come first, and we both agreed with that. Father had to pray every day, and he used to pray with great length. Father had to serve the church every day, and that was the way of life for both of us. Our children were the children of the church. People often stayed in our home, most days. People with special problems came. Father always came and told me that we would need to have someone to stay. He used to tell me that I need not ask what the problem was, but just to see what happened. Some stayed for weeks, months, or longer. One stayed for eight months. When the problem was solved, when all was well, they can go. Many have come to be our children. So this is Tassoni speaking about just how they gave their lives for the people they served. Abuna Paul, I believe, a few weeks ago, gave an amazing story that's also a well-known story of a young girl who was being taken from the church and being kidnapped, if you will, in a car. And Abuna, rather than sit back or call the police or whatever, ran after the car, jumped on the car, and got dragged by it until they were forced to stop, lest they sort of hurt him and injure him, in order to say, that's the life of the man who cared for his flock. When he saw someone in distress, he spent with it. He used to do visitations, and his rule for visitation was 20 minutes were sufficient. But if he found somebody in distress or in need, hours, days, months, years, whatever it took, he went to all lengths for the people he was given to serve. Abuna had also a very special group in his heart, the Muslims, okay? especially being in Egypt. He, had, he respected the search of individual Muslims for their eternal reality. He looked on them with courtesy and was constantly, constantly aware of the divine likeness within them. Their striving for Christian faith was another aspect of the transfiguration of the cross. Their painful exploration and in some instances their triumphant possession were signs of redemptive suffering and res resurrection. Which Abu Nabshoi baptized many Muslims who converted to Christianity. Much better to say converted to Jesus Christ as Lord and God. Okay, so here are some testimonies of some of the Muslims that he, that he worked with. So during his funeral, one of the many Muslims who attended the service was found at the church gate sobbing uncontrollably. He explained that he had spoken to the priest some years earlier and when his daughter was engaged to be married, he had no money and other traditional for traditional marriage expenses and Abuna Bishoy supplied everything they needed. There's also another story that Abuna one time was, so obviously it's fair to say, especially because he was baptizing Muslims into Christianity, he wasn't the most loved person um, in Egypt, and so therefore some of the Muslims would, would greet him in the streets by spitting on him or, um, or cursing him or whatever sort of that, you know, whatever, however they felt they wanted to, to greet him. And yet he would say that this was his connection with Christ, that that spit was something like, the Sunni would obviously get upset and be, be very hurt that, that they would do that, but he would say that this is, this is a glorious thing, rather, that he could partake with. And there was a story of a young boy who had 
done something similar to Abuna, spit on him and so on. And then Abuna got wind that that young boy broke his foot. So Abuna went to visit him in his home. He went to visit him in his home and his parents, they thanked him and they apologized for the boy. And so he was a man of, of love and service. He, his love knew no bounds. He went to anyone, anywhere that he could. Okay? Obviously, for those who know of Abuna and Abuna's story, cancer is a part of his story, and unfortunately it's the last part of his story. But Abuna, he was diagnosed with cancer in 76. And there's a rumor that some say that Abuna prayed for cancer, but we'll hear from Tasuni that this wasn't true. He didn't pray for cancer, but rather he accepted the cancer in two ways, as an agony and as a joy. As an agony, of course, because it was a miserable disease, especially in that time where the treatment maybe wasn't as, as available as it is today. But also... He saw it as a connection to the mysticism of those who come close to the crucified Christ in their pain. The joy was his expression of the cross as means of redemption and wholeness. So he saw cancer as a means to wholeness and redemption, as a means to being with his beloved. So this is what the Sunni says about cancer um, and uh, just Abuna and cancer. It says, this is not correct about whether Abuna prayed for cancer for himself. She said, this is not correct. He loved people who have cancer. He used to visit them more than twice a day when they were very sick. He would speak to them about heaven and about the cross they were bearing. He explained this illness as a mark from God that they were going to heaven quickly. He never asked for anything himself. When he was very sick, he could not stand or sit. I said that he ought to ask for good health. He said that he need not to ask the Lord for his Lord for anything. I am in his hands. I am ready to receive whatever he gives me. This is what Abuna Tadras Malati has to say. Finally, I do not want to forget his love, especially for those who are sick with cancer. He used to call it the disease of paradise. Because the patient feels that his days have come to an end, so he repents and shares Jesus Christ in his pains. He used to visit those patients almost daily and sometimes twice a day. So it's a reiteration of the same thing. If he heard about such patients outside of Alexandria, he would try to travel to him as if God had prepared his heart with love to share with those patients not only by visits, but also through actual pain. He had entered the temptation with them and passed it victoriously with spiritual faith. And then even Abuna was exchanging letters with, uh, with the late uh, Abuna Metta al-Miskin. And let's see what some of the things Abuna Metta was saying to Abuna Bshoy about this. So it says, in correspondence, Abuna Metta confirmed the place of cancer in Abuna's spirituality. So he said the following. He said, the sickness of the faithful servant whose heart remains uplifted by faith and love speaks more abundantly than the strength of thousands of the strong. In another letter, he writes to him, God reverts to, use a man, God reverts to the use of man's weakness, even the weakness of the body for witnessing. In the broken body, God confirms his word and uplifts the hidden min ministry of suffering. And then towards the end of Abuna's life, he wrote to him, he says, Joy be to you in your sufferings. My greetings with my love. Nothing can explain the bonds of Christian brotherhood and unity except the cross of Christ. Suffering, cancer, Abuna struggled a lot with it. I think he was diagnosed, as I said, in 76. He stopped praying liturgy sometime in 77, like towards Christmas in 77. He was not able to go forward, but he believed strongly in witnessing through, through his illness. And he never, in his treatment, there, there's stories of him meeting with doctors and nurses and just being a light, a beaming light to them, and never complained about his sickness once. For as he said, as he said to Tassoni, he said, I am in his hands and I am ready to receive whatever he gives me. And I tell you guys, there is no growth in our spiritual life if we're not ready to receive suffering, okay? I don't want, I wish we didn't have to suffer. And I, would, I wish that suffering wasn't, but it is, okay? And I'm not one who's comfortable with suffering. But if I learned something from Abu Nafshoi's life, it's that suffering can be a means to paradise. And I don't, I, it's hard for me to speak, thank God, but at the same time, I, I think that's how we should encourage each other in the suffering, the same way that Abu Nafshoi did. So suffering is a part of Suffering is the means by which we can attain, attain this glory. So I'm going to conclude now. Two cool things about the day that Father uh, Bishoy passed, which was March 21st, 1979. So on this day, there were two things that were marked on that day. The first was it was the third day of the Feast of the Cross. 
which is so fitting considering his love for the cross. And, and Abuna Tadros and many believe that this was God's way of honoring him and his affection for, for the cross. The Feast of the Cross is on March 19th, so three days was the third day of that feast. Also on March 21st was the day of the manifestation of the virginity of St. Demetrius the Vine Dresser. And if you don't know the story of St. Demetrius the Vine Dresser, he was a patriarch of Alexandria who was married but lived with his wife in virginity. And on the day, so basically people started to sort of, you know, ask questions and be like, what's, what's going on, what's going on? And so they never spoke about it, they never told the people, and then God said to him, you must reveal to the people the, the purity in which you live in your marriage. And so after the liturgy, he demanded that everybody stay, and he took a lit charcoal from, from the censer, from, and he put it on his, on his own cloth, and it didn't burn. And then his wife also, she put it on, on, her, uh, on something that she was wearing and also didn't burn. And the people believed and understood that day that they were living, uh, that they were living in virginity and they were pure and that he was, he was pure and chosen one for that papacy. The reason this is relevant is because some of you may know or some of you may not know that Abuna and Tassoni uh, also lived in, in virginity and they did, not, uh, they did not know each other sort of physically and they did not consummate their marriage in that way, but they lived... Um, a perfect ascetic life together. And so that was a secret, and nobody had, nobody had ever known that about them. But again, uh, it was revealed after their death. One of the early biographers uh, ended up revealing that. And so um, just another... Certainly, I'm not saying that all married couples need to do that. In fact, I don't encourage you to do that. Okay, but uh, when, when two people are together on the vision together on their calling, like even something like that which seems so impossible to us as men. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm wrapping up. My, my apologies. I'm so sorry. Okay. These are just words that we can live by from his journal, and then I'll conclude. This was his journal after he... Uh, the life of each Christian is a way marked by sweet crosses. Each cross ends in glory. The way of the cross is a school. Escaping from it means losing your future. Those who are careless with their cross lose their crown. The cross is not a theme for contemplation for a day or even a month or for any particular period, but the love for the cross is the whole life of the Christian. I have done Abuna no service in trying to give you his life today, but I only hope that through certain glimpses into the man he was that we can recognize that God is working in his people in this day and all days. And I hope that you as I have now found a new intercessor and a new father and someone that we can add to our personal clouds of witnesses so that we can grow in faith and love with Jesus Christ. Glory be to God forever. Amen.